This is our transition time. We had our announcements for our one another, and now we're together focusing upon our Lord. It's Memorial Day weekend. We remember those that sacrificed their lives. There's Veterans Day, those that served. Memorial Day is for those that sacrificed their lives for us. And so we'll, we'll touch on that this morning. But the most important thing that we remember on a Memorial Day on this Sunday is tomorrow we remember those that sacrificed their lives for our freedoms. And that's what we're doing at the Lord's table today, is we remember the one who sacrificed his life, the one for us all. And so let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you. We thank you for the plan, for the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Though we are sinners by nature, inherited from our parents all the way back to Adam and Eve, Lord, we're also sinners by choice. Lord, you said it for all, not are just our born sinners, but have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And so we stand in need of a Savior. Unable to save ourselves, unable to save one another, unable to come up with any scheming or conniving or um, gathering together to save ourselves from ourselves. You saved us. You sent your Son. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. As Pastor mentioned, our worship theme this morning is Jesus the sacrifice. Memorial is a day that we remember those who sacrificed for others, the military personnel who have died in the performance of their military duties while serving in the United States Armed Forces. Those who sacrifice is for the cause of our country's safety and freedom. But many times, what motivates their willingness to sacrifice is much more immediate. On the day of battle, soldiers sacrifice for one another in combat, and often it can cost them their lives. Two such examples, the first example is Michael Mansour. At the age of 25 years old, was a United States Navy SEAL who was killed during Operation Iraqi Freedom, and the Medal of Honor was awarded to his parents. His Delta platoon was sent to Iraq in 2006 and assigned to train Iraqi uh, Army soldiers. Over the next months, Mansour and his platoon frequently engaged in combat with insurgent forces. On September 29, 2006, an insurgent threw a grenade under a rooftop where Mansour and other SEALs and other Iraqi soldiers were positioned. Mansour quickly smothered the grenade with his body, absorbing the resulting explosion and saving his comrades from serious injury and probably death. Mansour died about 30 minutes later from the wounds caused by the grenade explosion. Petty Officer Mansour's actions could not have been more selfless or clearly intentional. Of the three seals on that rooftop corner, he had the only avenue of escape away from the blast, and if he had chosen, he could have easily escaped. Instead, Mansour chose to protect his comrades by the sacrifice of his own life. By his courageous and selfless actions, he saved the lives of his two fellow seals and potentially other Iraqi soldiers. The second example is Ross McGinnis. Ross Andrew McGinnis, at the age of 19 years old, was a U.S. Army soldier who as well was awarded the Medal of Honor to his parents for his actions during the Iraq War. In 2006 as well, while serving as the gunner in a Humvee in Baghdad, Iraq, his convoy was attacked and a hand grenade was thrown into his vehicle. McGinnis was killed in action when he deliberately threw himself on the grenade. When an Iraqi surgeon threw a grenade into the Humvee where Ross McGinnis uh, manned the machine gun, he had time to jump from the turret and save himself, but he didn't. In a matter of seconds, with his four comrades stuck inside, McGinnis yelled, grenade, into his microphone, dropped down the turret, and used his back to smother it. He absorbed the grenade's blast and saved the other men. In both of these stories, the soldiers or the individuals in the grenade's vicinity were threatened with physical death unless one man was willing to be 
a sacrifice in which Michael, Mansour, and Ross McGinnis were willing to absorb the grenade's blast to save their comrades. In the same way, and we know not exactly, but in a similar way, Jesus, the sacrifice, absorbs the blast, if you will, of God's wrath on the cross. Jesus died for you and me personally. Jesus willingly was the sacrifice for each one of us individually. Jesus endured the beating, on the cro- uh, be- beating prior to the cross, and then he was nailed to the cross to be our sacrifice. And it wasn't a split-second decision. He knew exactly what was going to be involved to be the sacrifice, our sacrifice. We face a certain spiritual death because of our sin. And without trusting in Jesus alone to be our personal sacrifice, we're in big trouble. So we remember today, Jesus Christ, the sacrifice. cross. The old rugged cross is the place where Jesus 
was and paid the ultimate sacrifice. Let's sing that old song together. Just a few stanzas. of that hymn will continue to meditate though the power of the cross it's a powerful place because of what Jesus did for us there we'll stand together to sing we'll come back to the scene of the cross but also think of its significance let's worship the Lord the power of the cross oh to see the dawn of the darkest day tree this next song says our response should be to love him my Jesus I love thee just a few stanzas I hope this is your heart today
Our scripture reading this morning is Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 9, Romans 5, 6 through 9, and I'd invite you just to listen as I read Romans 5, verses 6 through 9. For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet, peradventure, perhaps for a good man, someone would even dare to die. But God commendeth or showed his own love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, in this Memorial Day weekend, we are thankful for those who have made the ultimate sacrifice so that we could enjoy the freedoms, the prosperity that we do, the peace here in this great nation, the United States of America. Thank you for all those throughout the centuries who gave their lives so that we could be here today. And I pray that this weekend we would be sobered by that sacrifice, that we would be sobered uh, to think of those who are dead and in the grave, who died prematurely, leaving behind loved ones, leaving behind family members, friends, wives, children, so that we could enjoy freedom. And yet, as we think of that, I pray that our minds would also run to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the one who least of all deserve to die, deserve to be honored and glorified at your right hand. And yet he took on flesh and died a painful death on the cross, crying out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Separated even from you, his father, in that moment of anguish so that we could have freedom, freedom from sin, freedom from fear, freedom from anxiety, freedom from your wrath throughout all of eternity. Lord, we know that sometimes for good people, someone would dare to die, as this passage says. It's not very common, so we celebrate it, but sometimes it happens. And yet, when you died for our sins on the cross, you were dying for your enemies. And help us never to forget that that's who we were that you first loved us. Thank you for your tremendous love. And reminded as well by this passage that if we've been justified by your blood, how much more will we be saved from your wrath through Jesus, that we have nothing to fear in terms of the future, whether it be here on this earth or after we die, 
that we are safe in your hands because you loved us enough to send your son to die for us. You will never let us go. Lord, I pray that you would encourage us this morning through the preaching of your word. Pray that you would receive our tithes and offerings as a gift of worship back to you when we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated, and just to remember, we won't pass the plate this morning, but there'll be offering box and a plate as you leave this morning. Let's stand together. The children may be dismissed. Fours and five straight out the back door, first through sixth grade over on this side. We're in 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter, um, excuse me, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. You know, it's interesting. I want to, you want to stay in the passage you're preaching. I, I like to do that as much as possible. 
And I was thinking this past week, how am I going to do that in 1 Timothy 2? And it's going into the role of women and all of that kind of stuff in the church. And then I realized right there, sandwiched between the passage I was preaching last week and the one I was going to preach this week is this one. God has perfect timing, doesn't he? Let me read it. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for us all to be testified in due time. Whereunto I am ordained a preacher and an apostle, I speak the truth in Christ and I lie not, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and verity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, bless now the reading of your word. Bless now the preaching of your word. I pray that you help us to understand it. Lord, if there's anyone here who does not know Jesus Christ, the Savior, I pray that they would know today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Not everyone who died in the service of their country was a Medal of Honor winner. There are some that died in accidents, training to go to battle. There are some that died as a result of friendly fire. There are some that died in accidents in the battle and strange occurrences in the battle. Many, many have sacrificed their lives. My dad is the youngest of 12 children. The birth order in the family went like this, four boys, five girls, three boys. Imagine that for a moment. Of all the boys, one remains living. Of the seven, all five girls are still alive today. There is one family photograph of the entire family together. In all of the, you know, the years of raising all of those children, I think of my, my grandmother, because there were 12 ch children, no twins, Therefore, nine years of her life she spent expecting children. Think about that for a moment. Um, they, they had one family photograph, and I remember looking at this photograph oftentimes because it was my dad's family. It was the only time all of them together in one picture. And right in the middle was my Uncle Junior, who I never met, um, dressed in his army uniform. He was the only one dressed in the army uniform. When World War II started, and yes, my dad's older brothers, since dad is the youngest, his older brothers, fought in World War II. There were four older brothers. Three of them immediately went into the army. There was a fourth one, Junior. He was the one that was designated to stay home and help with the farm. After all, you needed a boy on the farm. The girls could do a lot of the things, but you, know, you still needed a boy on the farm. Uh, but it was no time for a young man of fighting age to be home from the war, especially when your three older brothers went. And so he remained home, but oftentimes he would sign the enlistment papers and put them in the mailbox, and my grandfather would go out to the mailbox and take them out of the mailbox. And finally there was one day when he quit trying. My grandfather, not my uncle. And he went in. And so he fought in the army. All, I think all four of them were fighting in, um, in Europe. Uh, my uh, uncle Hubert is what his name was. That's what his name was growing up. That's what all the family called him. When he, when he got into the army, he found out his first name was John. He was really excited about that because to everybody else the rest of his life, he was John. He, got, he dumped that Hubert name really quick. He was one of our, you know, one of the claim to fame for the Shaw family. I don't know if you understand this, but I am a giant in the Shaw family, as far as stature goes. He was the shortest man in the Army Air Corps in World War II, five feet even. He, by the way, was a career officer in the Air Force, uh, was a colonel, imagine a five foot tall colonel. They met up several different times, several of the brothers during World War II. It came toward the end of the war and they were fighting. And um, my uncle Junior um, was fighting in the Hurtkin Forest toward the end of the war. It was some of the most horrible fighting. If you, if you study World War II, 
They understand what happened in the Hurtgen Forest. It was, it was miserable close quarters fighting in the middle of a deluge. And so these guys were fighting in the rain, in the mud. The vehicles got bogged down in the mud. It was, it was filthy. It was dirty. It was vicious. It was just, it was just horrible circumstances. My grandmother, the family tells this, my grandmother woke up one night in the middle of the night and said, something's wrong with Junior. I don't know how that works, but she just knew. They got notification not long afterwards that he had been killed fighting the Hurricane Forest. You know, there were thousands, tens of thousands of soldiers fighting on both sides. You know, and in, in, in the vicious fighting, and especially the massive amounts of soldiers that were fighting in, a pla- in, in World War II, even in a place like this, you, you have many dying every day, and, and, and those that fall, you know, he stepped on a landmine. You know, there's, there's this just fighting, and all of a sudden, boom, it's over. Sometimes we think of, you know, things dramatic and, you know, the stories that we tell. But in the middle of the battle, sometimes there's just another body on the ground. But back home, back home, this is a precious child. This is somebody's child, somebody's brother, somebody's loved one. But in the battle, you just have the thousands. And sometimes, you know, and, and in, the, in the fighting, we have not had fighting like this. We've had not had dying like this in our recent history in the country. We've had fighting. We've had people going to battle. But when, we, when you have people, people dying in battle, it might be in the tens, not in the thousands. And sometimes the, the fighting isn't so glorious. I remember my, my uncle Hubert used to visit our family often uh, during the time that I was a child. I don't know, he, just, he was kind of a nomad. He was single and you know, had a jalopy of a truck and would just show up at our house at various times. And so we'd talk and we'd listen. And I, One of the things I caught over the years is there was a level of bitterness in his heart for the loss of his brother. You say, well, shouldn't that, you know, there's a, there's a you know, dying in the service for, his, for your country. But you understand that there are sometimes soldiers look at certain battles as futile. You know, there is some general, some place who decided we need to fight here and we need to fight now. And it really wasn't necessary to, f- to fight that battle and to die in that battle. And it's in lives, precious lives are wasted. It happened often in the history of warfare. Take that hill. All kinds of people die taking that hill, and then the command is to withdraw from the hill and to give up that very thing that you fought to achieve. And so while we take the time on Memorial Day to remember those that that sacrificed in the heat of battle, we do also remember that war is misery and war is a lot of times a waste. Now it doesn't mean that the, the ends achieved are not noble. The freedoms that we have as Americans are worth fighting for. And they're worth dying for, to preserve from one generation to the next. And it has taken not the sacrifice of one, but the sacrifice of many, many, to preserve those freedoms. And what a horrible thing to walk away from them when they've been achieved at such a great cost. Then we come to this passage of Scripture. You see, this sacrifice so is different, the sacrifice of Jesus. Because this, this one talks about him giving himself a ransom for many. And there are all different kinds of aspects here that, that, that are different than the sacrifices that the 
the soldiers have made in battle. First of all, there was only one person that could have fought. There's only one person that could have died. There's only one person that could have made the sacrifice. The sacrifices of anyone else. We could all give up our lives for the purpose of seeing others come to know Jesus Christ as Savior, but not one of us could die for the sins of someone else. The burden of all of humanity was on one who had to make a sacrifice beyond anything human beings can imagine. I think about my uncle. Um, You know, the others, they got married, they had children, they had lives, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, you know, all of that. He never got married, never had children. You know, there's a a whole, not just the, the sacrifice of living in the moment, but there's the sacrifice of the entire life that would have happened yet in the future. And all of the things that would have happened beyond that. I mean, it, it, is, it is difficult for us to even imagine all of that. But let me remind you of something. The sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross is, is way beyond any sacrifice any human being has ever made. And that's why we want to come to this passage of Scripture and take a look at the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made. We have this Memorial Day, so we're remembering those who have sacrificed. It's also, we have a memorial, and we're going to observe it here in just a little bit. Let me encourage you, if you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, not even, if, if, even if you're not a member of our church, to stay and observe this with us. The, the observance of the Lord's table is the highest, I believe, that, you know, that highest aspect of worship for the New Testament church. It is not something to skip. Can I just encourage you? It's something to participate in. Because it is so, so important, not only to, for us to remember, but for us to honor the one who is watching us honor him. So, let's talk about the sacrifice of Christ for a moment. And here are the principles here. It's in, found in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Now, as Paul is explaining to Timothy, he says here to pray for those who are rulers, pray for kings, pray pray for those in authority. We talked about that last week, the responsibility to pray for everyone, even people that we disagree with, even the people that we don't normally want to pray for, even the people that we think might be hopeless, all of that we need to pray for. And And we saw that in the context, the Roman context, Nero, who was the emperor of Rome at the time, and and folks... Somebody mentioned it in our, in our Sunday school class. I soft-pedaled the wickedness of Nero because it's just it's too sinful to talk about in the pulpit. Okay? We come here and we see, he said, this is good and acceptable God, to God. Why? Because he wills that all types of people, he wills that all men would be saved. And we cannot stand in judgment deciding, I'm going to pray for you, but I'm not going to pray for you. I want you to get saved, but I don't want you to get saved. Jesus Christ died on a cross for the sins of mankind. He died for all. And it is not our prerogative to decide who is worthy of salvation and who is not. The Apostle Paul, of course, was sensitive to this because he was one that was a persecutor of the Jews. He was one of the persecutor of the Christians is on his way to Damascus. And here's what he said. There's one God and one mediator between God and man. So let's talk about the principles of the sacrifice of Christ. First of all here, this principle that there is one God. There is a God. And there, and there, is, only, there, there is a God. There, that is not something that is made up. When you look at the world around us, we covered this on uh, Own Your Faith. There, there is something in you, you know it. God has manifested in you. We look at the world around us. You can't explain your own existence without God himself. You can't explain your own awareness of yourself, or your awareness of the universe, or the order of the universe, or how everything that has come to be, or how we have a sense of right and wrong, or why human beings worship. Because worship doesn't make sense outside the existence of God and understanding of God in our own hearts. Why? You know, all of these things, there, folks, there is a God. In fact, it doesn't really take even that much defense. The Bible starts out these, uh, the first words of Scripture in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning God. It just declares God's existence. You say, well, I don't believe that he exists. That doesn't mean he doesn't. 
There are people that believe the world is flat. There are people who believe the earth is the center of the universe. There are people that believe all kinds of things. It doesn't mean it's true. You say, well, I'm going to live in the world of my own beliefs. And I'm going to live in the world of the things that I believe and I want to be true. You can live in a fantasy land or you can live in the, the, the realm of truth and the realm of reality. You say, well, Pastor Shaw, how do you know that you are not in reality? Well, read the Word of God and look at the world around you. There is one God. There is a God. Now, it is interesting that there is only one God, and this matters. There's not only a God, there is only one. There's not two, there's not three, there's not five, not ten, not twenty, not fifty. There isn't just the, the idea of the force, this kind of God-like substance that, that goes throughout all of the universe, and, and you know, that there, there, those things don't exist. There is, there is one God. And this mattered as the Apostle Paul was writing to Timothy, because Timothy was, was preaching and teaching in a, in, in a polytheistic context. He was preaching and teaching to Romans and to Greeks. He was in Ephesus. He was in Asia Minor. He was in the Greek peninsula where you had the Roman and the Greek religions that had many different gods. And it would have been tempting to say, well, they have their own religion and we have our own religion and they have their God and we have their God. Their God is no God. Hey, what you have is good for you, and what I have is good for me. There is not two truths. There is one truth. There is, there is one God. There is one God to which every human being will give account. That's what Philippians chapter 2 says. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. When the Apostle Paul went to Athens and he preached on Mars Hill and he preached to the philosophers and he went, he went through the Acropolis there and he, and he saw all of the different uh, idols to the various gods. He says, there is this one God to the unknown God. They had that, that idol to the unknown God. He says, this is the one I'm going to declare unto you. And then he, said, he goes to say, this is the God that created the universe. This is the God that sustains the universe. He explained that this is the only God. All the others are fakes. All the others are imposters. There's only one. This God is self-existent. What does that mean? He is who he is. He isn't who you want him to be. He is who he is. He isn't what others want him to be. God is not elected. God is not, he's not formed by the opinions of human beings. Well, everybody believes that God is this, or everybody believes that God is that. And, and of course, we take the, the multiplicity of everybody's beliefs and we say, okay, then that must be what God is. That's silly. God is who he is. He is who he has declared himself to be. You say, well, I don't like it. I'm sorry. He is who he is. When we say he's self-existent, uh, the theological term is he's transcendent. What does that mean? If you take all of the universe and everything that it contains, all the human beings, all the planets, all the stuff, all the stars, you know, all the things that are seen and unseen in the universe in a, in a moment, wipe it all out. It would all be gone. He would be no less who he is than the moment before. He is not dependent upon you. We, we kind of talked about God like he is. Oh, you have to do this and you have to do that because if you don't do this, then God can't do that. I'm sorry. There are very few things that God can't do. There are many things that God chooses not to do and tells us that he chooses not to do on his, because he has chosen not to do them, but there are very few things that God can't do. One of the things God can't do is not be God. He is who he is. And therefore, all those things that are his characteristics, his attributes, those are intrinsic to who he is. He, can't, he doesn't change himself. So there is this, this God, there is a God, 
to whom all of us will give account, there is only one God, so you can't choose another one. You can't you know, go, to, go to a book and try to find another one. You can't take this God and make him in the image that you want him to be and make him be the type of person that you want him to be. He is who he is. Therefore, we can't manufacture our own gods to meet our specific needs, to be special to us, to meet our own sensibilities. The, the Greeks did that. They had the God of this and the God of that, and they could pray to the God of this and the God of that. And then they'd start talking about their gods, and they, their gods developed personalities, and they had all the, the foibles and the weaknesses of human beings. They made gods just like superhuman beings, the, the whole idea of superheroes that we see so prominent in American culture and American entertainment today are simply based upon the ideas of the, the Roman and Greek gods, sort of superhuman people. In fact, they've, even some of those super superheroes are, are characterized as these types of gods. They're not real! Can I just remind you they're not real? So we can't manufacture our own god he is who he is, and you will give an account to him. Not only that, we cannot judge him. I'm angry at God. Who are you? We certainly have a heightened sense of our own existence, don't we? That's what the book of Job was about. I mean, the first book of the Bible that was written wasn't Genesis, it was Job. And, and Job starts out with, uh, you know, all the, the difficulties that he's faced, the loss, the loss of his family and the loss of his wealth and the loss of his health, and he ends up with nothing and he ends up in, in misery and he's going through all of these things. And his friends, of course, they don't help very much. They come along and say, well, there must have been some sin or something in your life that has led to all of this. And Job couldn't find any particular sin in his life that would have led to, to all of the calamity. And we know that there was something going on in, in heaven where God just allowed him to go out go through those trials for God's glory. And Job, he's struggling with not only his friends, but with, with God. And, and we come to the end and God says, wait a minute, who are you to stand in judgment over the creator of all the earth, over the creator of all the universe? Who are you to stand in judgment over that God? We are so arrogant. We are so proud as human beings. We, as Americans tend to do that, we tend to think everybody in the world should be just like us. They shouldn't. In fact, many times they're just too much like us. I traveled in the mid-1990s to Siberia. It was not long after the fall of the Iron Curtain. It was a different world there. You didn't have advertising like we have. You, had to, you were going to go to a store to find a... Um, you know, to find something, you know, basic needs or a bakery or something like that. They didn't have, really have signs on the stores. And they could be anywhere. There were, things weren't designed to sell. Why? Because it wasn't a, based upon a commercial economy. But there was American culture, even at that time, that was starting to come in. But you know what we export most quickly as Americans? The worst part of who we are. And then we think everybody should be like us. <laughs> and everybody should, should be, be like us. We, can't, we, we get to be so arrogant, standing in judgment over God, saying God should have done it this way, and he should do this, and he shouldn't have let this happen in my life, and he shouldn't let this happen. And if he's really God, and he's really a loving God, how about all of these things? And we stand in judgment over him as if we know better than he does. The creator of the, heaven, of the heavens and the earth, the one who is omniscient, there's one God. And there's one mediator. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. So we, we've established the idea that there's one God. Now, we understand that there's us too. So we have God and then there's you. And you were created to have a relationship with God. The relationship... With, of mankind with God is essential. When, when Adam and Eve were created, they were created to have fellowship with God. They walked and talked with God in the garden. 
We are created in the image of God. We'll talk about that tonight. So that means that we, have, we are created to have fellowship with God. That's part of what the image of God in man is. That's who we are. And so this relationship is essential, but mankind is estranged from God. Well, how do we become estranged from the God? The story of that is in the garden where Adam and Eve sinned. And when they sinned, the entire human race fell. You say, well, what? it's just such a terrible thing. That, you know, God just set them up and they ate of the wrong tree and that was it. They fell. Just such a little simple infraction, and we have such horrible consequences. I hope you understand that there was more to the sin of Adam and Eve than that. There was a sin of unbelief. You see, why was it that Eve ate the fruit? Because she allowed herself to be convinced that God was keeping something from her. See, it wasn't just the fruit. It was about the violation of the relationship. It was about the trust. It was about Eve believing that God was lying. That was at the heart of Eve's sin. And of course, Adam, the Bible tells us Eve was deceived, which of course means that Adam, the indication there is that Adam was not deceived. We'll get to that in this next passage. You say, well, see, then it's all Eve's problem. Now, let me ask you a question. If Adam wasn't deceived, why did he eat the fruit? He made a deliberate choice to rebel against his creator, he turned from his God. And therefore, mankind has become estranged from God. We're, but, and so we're all born with this bent to sinning, the, the hymn writer says. So, you know, we're born, you don't have to teach your kids to sin. How many of you say, I, I had to teach my kids to sin, you know, to tell lies and get angry and fight with their brothers and sisters. You know, they they just didn't want to naturally do it, so I had to kind of encourage it a little bit. Here's some boxing gloves. Go at it. You you didn't have to do that. We're, We're born with that natural bent to sinning. But we also are sinners by choice. The Bible says in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Doesn't say all are born in sin, although we are. But it also says we have chosen to sin. We have also chosen to act upon our nature and sin against the holy God. And so therefore, there's this one God. We only get one and we are estranged from him. That one for whom we are created to have fellowship. And we we are estranged from him. Turned away, and of course, that means that we are turned away from all the blessings of his presence, all the blessings of living with him forever, all the blessings of praising him, all the blessings of glorifying him, because sin has has created this barrier between us and God. Isaiah chapter 59, verse 1, God's hand isn't short that it cannot save, his ear is not hard that it cannot hear, but our iniquities, our sins have separated between us and God. There's something between. You know, it's, it's typical human beings. There are things that happen that estrange one person from another. And, I, you know, the male, t- male response typically to that is, well, let's just ignore it until we've all forgotten about it and move on like it never happened. But for many people, there's a term that we use for that. There's the elephant in the room that has to be acknowledged. That, that big thing that happened, those words that you said, that thing that you did, that thing that you failed to do, that, that relationship that you had that created the conflict in this relationship. And until this is acknowledged, until it is addressed, that relationship cannot be restored. Well, there is an elephant in the room, and that is our sinfulness that is separated between us and a holy God. You see, God is holy. 
He can't look upon sin. He's just. He has to judge sin. And so a mediator is necessary. Because of the holiness of God, because of the sinfulness of mankind. That mediator's purpose is to restore the damaged relationship between God and mankind. We take a look and we see his holiness and our sinfulness. So what's the purpose of the mediator? It's to restore relationship. You take two people. And they can choose to get lawyers. You know, they're in conflict with one another. Businesses have people sign this. You know, you, you sign up. If you're an employee, you're going to use mediation first. Marriage conflict, there's a divorce, we're going to use mediation first. Or you can both get lawyers, and you can be in conflict until everybody is poor except the lawyers. Or you can choose a mediator. Someone that is agreeable to both of you, that will stand in between and broker a peace. That's usually what a mediator does. That's the mediator's purpose. So there's one God, and there's only one mediator. So there, is only, there are not many paths to God. I, I, I know that people will say that. People in Christianity, supposedly that believe in Jesus Christ, the Savior, will say, well, you know, there's, there's Buddhism, and there's Islam, and there's Confucianism, and there are all these religions in the world, and there are these many paths to God. There is one God and one mediator between God and man. There's only one path to your creator, and that is through Jesus Christ. So the purpose of the mediator is to restore relationship, to bring peace. Where there has been enmity is the Bible word, conflict. There's one God, there's one mediator, but there's only one mediation. There's only one remedy. See, the mediator has to be a man. <laughs> Notice what it says. For there's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Now, it is interesting. You say, well, okay, Pastor Shaw, was Jesus a man or was he God? And the answer to that is yes. You say, how do you, well, does the Bible teach both? We'll take a look. Verse 3. Verse 3 says this, for this is good and acceptable in the sight of who? Of who? Who is what? Our Savior. The God who is our Savior. Well, who is our Savior? Jesus Christ is our Savior. Therefore, this passage of Scripture, the Apostle Paul is saying that Jesus is God, but Jesus is also the man. It was necessary for the mediator to be a man, but that mediator needed to have access to God. Therefore, he must be a holy man, untouched by the sins of mankind. So he couldn't have, he couldn't be born with the sin nature that all of the rest of us were born with. That's why the Bible teaches that Jesus was born of a virgin conceived in the womb of Mary by the Holy Spirit. So he's a, he, he is man, he is holy man, but he is also God. He is, he is both of those things so that he could be the mediator between God and man. The mediator must have access to God. He must be holy. And Jesus was holy. The Bible says he was tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He's holy. He must be untouched by sin. And then he's going to do the work of mediation. Now, it's, it's really interesting when he does the work of mediation. Most mediators settle differences of the sides through negotiation. Okay, you give a little bit here, and you give a little bit here. Now, sometimes it's like you give a lot and you give a little. But, you know, there's some sort of negotiation here. But here's the problem that we face as human beings. Our sinful condition means no negotiation is possible. 
We have sinned and the penalty for sin is death and that is justice. There's no plea bargains allowed. God is a just God. The the sin is is clear. The consequences are clear. And that's where we are. So, So what's the solution? Well, the solution comes from God's end, not ours. You see, God is a just God. You say, well, I, I don't believe. And, you know, I, I just don't think it's right that people should have such consequences for sin. For God to change that is to change his very nature, his character. There are certain things that God cannot do. And God cannot choose to be not holy. And so, God's solution was to provide a substitute. In this case, the mediator doesn't negotiate a peace. The mediator becomes the sacrifice to secure the peace. This mediator chose to give himself, that is, his life for for ransom. He doesn't just settle the terms. The penalty, of course, is fixed. And so the mediator chose to give his own life. And remember this. It wasn't that God chose to sacrifice his son. You say, but didn't he do that? Yes, he did that. But don't forget, those three are one God, and the son chose to lay down his life. Jesus even declared so at the point of, 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 of the crucifixion. He could have called for the angels to, to free him. Now, you have Roman soldiers, so it certainly looked like he was under condemnation and he couldn't do anything about it. But make no mistake about it, Jesus went to Jerusalem for the very purpose of being the sacrifice. Jesus laid down his life. Jesus hung on the cross voluntarily for you and for me. He chose to give his own life. He chose to make himself the ransom, the payment. For us all. As Pastor Jason so aptly described this morning, he took the full blast of sin. The Bible describes it like this He became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. He took sin's penalty upon himself, and he gave to us his righteousness. And we made this great exchange, the righteousness of Jesus Christ, for our great sinfulness, the best deal any human being can ever possibly make. Oftentimes there are good deals you face in life. And they're on the table for a little while, and if you walk away, it's gone. If you're here this morning and you've not accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as payment for your sin, the deal is still on the table. And you can still accept it. Don't walk away from it. Don't walk away. Don't walk into a Christless eternity. Don't walk into hell voluntarily. And if you are here this morning and you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, and you reject it this morning, you will remember it forever. You have opportunity. The mediator chose to give his life. By the way, he is God. So he is the extension of God's love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, his one and only son, his unique son, God is love, and God is just. And so his justice and his love meet together in Jesus. And so he's the extension of God's love. It's interesting. He's the ransom for us all. His life sacrifice is sufficient for all of us. Notice it says, He made himself a ransom for us all. 
who gave himself a ransom. Who? For all of us. There's no one else that gets to God any other way. It's always through Jesus Christ. But that sacrifice must be accepted by faith. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes on him. It isn't automatic that we receive the freedoms. Do you, do you understand this? Memorial Day. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have given their lives in the service of this country for the protection of your life and for the preservation of your freedoms. But unless you possess them, you won't keep them. You have to accept them. And in the same way, we have to accept the gift of salvation. I have to choose to believe, to depend upon the work of Jesus Christ on the cross. I have to trust him. I have to acknowledge my need. I'm a sinner. There is a God. I'm a sinner. I am estranged from God. I need Jesus. I'm going to go through Jesus to have a relationship with God. I am going to be depend upon the finished work of Christ on the cross alone, not on my own righteousness because I have none, not on my own good works because I have none, but on Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. You come to him that way and you'll never be cast out. The sacrifice must be accepted by faith. This ransom is God's living testimonial of his love given in perfect time who gave himself a ransom for us all to be testified. By the way, that's the word where we get martyr from. To be a living testimonial at the exact appropriate time so that now you might receive the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. The question I have for you is this. Would you receive the sacrifice? Let's stand together, heads bowed, eyes closed. This is an invitation time. I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond to the message. I want you to ask yourself this question. It's just you, just you and God. Do you know Jesus Christ as Savior? I'm not asking if you prayed a prayer at some point in your life. Do you have the gift of salvation? I'm not asking if you've told people that over and over again because many people have declared over and over again to others that they are saved and they are not. Are you depending upon the finished work of Jesus Christ for your eternal salvation? Have you been born again? If you have not, why not in this moment do so? With your heads bowed and eyes closed, lift your, lift your heart up to heaven and tell God you're a sinner. Just right now. Tell God you're a sinner. Admit it. It's not that hard. Why hang on to our own righteousness when it's, it's a false perception of ourselves? Tell God you know you can't fix this. Tell him that you believe that Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again according to the scriptures for you and for your sin. Ask him to forgive you and to save you from your sin and transform your life. And then if you've done that, thank him. Because the promise of God is this, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved.